Colossians chapter 2, our study tonight is back in verse 9 through verse 15. It's a very basic elementary Bible study, but it is absolutely filled with good news for each and every one of us. Would you read along with me, please? For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you, <clears throat> Ron, and you can write your name there, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, in Christ, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. And believe me, if you need a surgeon, that's the one you want. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Father, this short passage of scripture just makes us want to shout thank you. You did this for us when we were yet your enemies. Christ died for the ungodly. Well, that describes every man and every woman in here. And then, Jesus, we met you. And all of that changed. Tonight, let us understand the fullness that we have been given. Tonight, Lord, the significance of having the written code canceled and nailed to the cross. Let that ring true in our hearts and fill us with joy. I do pray, Father, if there's anyone here tonight who isn't yet born again, that talking about this old cross filled with nail holes. I pray that we would be drawn to you and to your family, Lord. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. And now minister to us for your glory. Amen. Probably most of you have been here for a Good Friday service and then an Easter service follow-up. Um, Easter is coming up soon. We're going to be doing it again. We've been doing it for years and years and years. But what we do on the Good Friday night service is we put a big cross right over here where Ziamora is sitting. And as people come in, and people get here really early because we're crowded, when people come in on that Good Friday, we give them a piece of paper. And then there are things that they can write on the paper. Whatever it is that God's dealing with them about, it's sort of like one of those, okay, the struggle can end. And we come up and there are people who will give us a hammer and nails and we'll nail those pieces of paper with the things that we've written to that cross. And all throughout the worship on that Good Friday night, in the background is the sound of nails being pounded into a cross. It's very poignant. It's emotional for a lot of us. As I said, we've been doing it for a whole lot of years. I don't even know how many so many that we've almost worn out our cross. Tonight, during this Bible study, my prayer is that you will hear the sound of those nails being pounded into the cross throughout the entire Bible study because those nails are being pounded in for you and for me. Verse 9, and we were here last time, for in Christ all the fullness of of the deity lives in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Now, clearly the emphasis on the fullness. There's nothing that you can add. We keep trying to add stuff to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe we think it's too easy or maybe we think, no, there's got to be something that I can contribute. But the reality is there's nothing that we can contribute God did all the work. It was even his initiative to chase us down. And there's nothing more that we can 
be given. There's nothing that we can add. We absolutely have nothing at all to bring to the table. It's just Jesus. He loves you. And he considered you so worth it that he was willing to go to the cross and suffer the agony. For the joy set before him, that joy has a name. Personally, it's Ron and Paula, and you can put your name there. There's nothing that we can add. In him, verse 11 says, you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Now, as we read the word in the putting off, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in just a little while. But the idea here is that we're disengaging it. It's almost like you want to use some utility and it's plugged in and nothing happens when you turn it off and it's because somebody has unplugged it and there's simply no connection and it has no value. It's being rendered inoperative or useless. That's what's said about our sinful nature. Now, I don't know about yours, but my sinful nature is pretty useless. And I'm glad that it's been disconnected from the source of power, that source of power that I was once connected to, the devil, my flesh, the world that we live in. And God is simply, when we met him, he's unplugged the connection for our sinful nature. And all we have to do is stay with him and we need not be tempted and give in any longer. Now, Paul's tone changes here just a little bit in Colossians as his attention is drawn now to the Jewish legalists in Colossae. Now, there's all kinds of problems in Colossae. There were false teachers coming in. I told you at the very beginning tonight that this was a very basic Bible study. Whenever there are false teachers, whenever there's false doctrine, it's always good to go back to the basics. Now, the primary heresy was Gnosticism. But it was by no means the only one. Angelology, astrology, philosophy, and even oriental mysticism were all being practiced in the church as things necessary to bring to our faith. Now, none of these people would deny Jesus Christ. They wouldn't deny the work that he did on the cross, but it wasn't enough for them to say, Jesus is enough. Jesus is all we need. And so they would bring these things and sound very reasonable in the process to add to our faith. But as we just read in the verse, our faith is already full in Christ. So nothing could be added. There's nothing could be taken away. You and I, we have fullness in Christ. And to look for anything else or to try to add anything else to it is simply being foolish. Now, the rest of this is for us. This Bible study, I hope, really, really encourages you. He says, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Now, the legalists were saying that it's, it's okay to talk about grace, to teach grace, but you have to add circumcision to be saved. We have churches in our culture that, that say you have to be baptized to be saved. Paul is later going to equate baptism with circumcision because they both serve the same purpose. Circumcision, as you know, was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. It was a physical symbol representing a spiritual reality. It's important. It was symbolic. God didn't need to know who was circumcised and who wasn't. In the same way, we don't get baptized to be saved. We get baptized because we're all saved. But it's a physical picture of the spiritual reality that occurs in our heart. Now, circumcision, and we all know this, it was a painful cutting away of the flesh. It hurts. That was what was intended by the Lord. Now, we know that Something physical doesn't save. There's no spiritual value in being circumcised today. It was simply a public identification with the God of Israel. Now, Jewish baby boys were to be circumcised on the eighth day. Pain wasn't an issue. That's why God chose the eighth day. And even if they actually experienced a little bit of pain, there'd be no lingering memory of it. So circumcision, it wasn't something that would traumatize the baby. So it wasn't a big deal 
for a baby. But let's put ourselves in Abraham's place. Let's put ourselves in the place of all the people that traveled with him. Or let's put ourselves in the place of the Jews in the Exodus wilderness. Circumcision was no longer practiced in Egypt. And then when they left for 40 years wandering around in the Exodus wilderness, they weren't circumcised. So before they had to go into the promised land, they needed to be circumcised to renew that covenant with God. Now, these were grown adult males. I have one word for you. Ouch. It required a commitment, a sacrifice. I was once in a pretty bad car wreck in Hollywood, actually, is where the accident occurred. I was in the hospital in North Hollywood for about seven days, I think, eight days, maybe. can't remember exactly. But one of the people that was in the room with me was a man named Asa, an adult male. I said, so what are you in for? And he says, well, I need a circumcision. And it was a medical circumcision. I got to tell you, he was in so much pain the entire time I was there. A painful cutting way of the flesh. Well, that's what Paul is saying. It's not an outward or physical, but a spiritual cutting away of the flesh. And it's painful for us as well. Not the same kind of pain. But Jesus is concerned with the matters of the heart. I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, well, what does God want from me? And I always answer the same way. All he wants is you. He wants your heart, and he wants you to give it to him. So how do we do it? Well, verse 11 says, we put off the sinful nature. Now, that sounds so easy. It really does. Just, just put off the sinful nature. But it means exactly what it says, because it's rendered useless, because there's no power, no connection to the sinful nature any longer. Once we're in Christ, we simply push it away. When we're tempted... We take those temptations, those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. We surrender our will to the will of God time and time again. Now, if you are born again, and I assume most of you in this room are, you've already surrendered your heart. So the idea here is to surrender the rest of you, your will. God, your will, not my will be done and that's what needs to be put off or put to death daily, your will. It's a choice that we make when we get up in the morning. It's a choice that we revisit over and over and over as we are tempted. We have to remember, no, 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 Lord, not what I want, but what you want is what matters. We simply have to learn to say no to our flesh. Now, as simple as that sounds when we say it, there is a mechanism by which God teaches us. And that mechanism is grace. Not the grace that saves, but the grace that lives every day. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright lives in this present age. Simply put, we have to learn to say no when we're tempted. If somebody brings you some heresy, you have to do this or you have to, to be this, we, we have to just simply say no. We're going to put all of that off. Now, this isn't a unique statement in the New Testament. Paul talks about it a lot in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. He says that we're to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, I told you it was to render your flesh useless. But there's more than that here because the Greek word for putting off is a, a business term. And it means to divest yourself of a bad deal. My flesh was a bad deal. When I met Jesus Christ and my flesh was put to death. Now, again, we fight our flesh every day. But my flesh was literally put to death. I entered into a completely new business deal. It would be like investing today in a typewriter company or investing in a cassette tape store. 
You know, I could give you a sales pitch and both of those things would sound like, boy, that's useful. I could do those things. But if you invested in it, of course, you go broke. Well, if you and when you invest in your flesh, spiritually speaking, we go broke and there isn't a man or a woman in this room who hasn't found themselves broke and broke in because we gave in to the flesh when we didn't have to. The first way to give up your heart to Jesus is to put off your sinful nature. How do we do it? Resisting temptation is hard. How do we do it? Write this down, please. You can't. You can't. You can't fight your flesh. But Jesus in you, having nailed the code that was against us to the cross, Jesus will do the fighting for us. That's why this verse that says he is the surgeon that performed the circumcision of our heart. I've had heart surgery, had a couple of complications after the fact. I've never had a complication from the surgery that Jesus performed on my heart way back in 1991. It was a perfect surgery, no after effects, and all I had to do was enjoy the work that Jesus accomplished. Remember, your flesh doesn't want to die, but you have the power given to you by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to say no and to live in victory over your flesh. Here's the motive, verse 12. Having been buried with him, in, with Christ, in baptism, and raised with him in Christ, or raised with Christ through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Now, I separated verse 12, although it probably should have been right after verse 11 in the study, but I want you to think about this. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, remember, roll back the stone, oh no, Lord, by now he stinketh, his sister said. Jesus said, roll it away. He called out, Lazarus came, come forth, and Lazarus came out in his grave clothes. And make no mistake, those grave clothes really did stink. But imagine, now Lazarus is back alive. It's a funny picture, at least in my mind. He would have been wrapped like a mummy when he had to come out hopping. And so Jesus looks at the attendants and says, take off the grave clothes. But what if Lazarus would have said, well, well, no, I like these clothes. I don't want to take them off. And people would say, yeah, but they're stinky. What if he said, well, I don't mind the smell. I like these clothes. Well, the reason I bring that up is because that's exactly what a lot of us as Christians do. We're rescued from something because of what Jesus did in the cross. And then we run right back to it. We run back to the old friends, the old parties, the old bad habits. I think of the man that was healed at the pool of Bethesda. Do you want to be made well? I have no one to help me. Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. Jesus was there. And suddenly he was well again. But Jesus later had to go find him and tell him, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. It's an amazing thing about the human nature that we can be delivered from something that almost killed us. And the minute we're delivered, we get up with fullness of strength. We walk right back into those old, ugly, stinky circumstances. That's what happens when we appease our flesh. Well, because he brings in baptism here, Baptism is another picture, a physical picture of a spiritual reality. When we get baptized, we are immersed completely underwater to symbolize our funeral. That's what a baptism is. It's a funeral service. When I got baptized, it was Paula who baptized me. That was really taking a risk because she could have kept me under forever. But when she baptized me, it was me dying. I was being buried, immersed. Because I was dead now. And then when I come up out of the water, it's symbolic of 
this wonderful promise of a new life, a resurrected life. That's the really great part about baptism. Because that's when new life begins. New life begins when we're saved, but, but the, the, the symbol, the outward symbol, is we're showing to everybody that knows us. We're not the same person. There's a whole new me that has come to life. It means no longer doing the things you used to do. Instead, you do what God has assigned you to do, what God asks you to do. That's why the past tense of these verses, beginning in verse 10, is so important. You have been buried. Your sins have been forgiven. And all we have to do is purpose in our hearts to walk in the newness of life. That's something that's so critical for all of us to understand. We don't have to give in to sin and temptation any longer. Now, we're not perfect. We have flesh, and we will sin. We get started in 1 John in about four weeks on Sundays. John's going to say, look, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth isn't in you. We all sin. But I'm afraid that too many of us, having had the written code canceled against, against us and, and being made completely new in Christ, I'm afraid too many of us use the fact that we can't be perfect to justify the sin that we want to embrace. And that's just like those stinky grave clothes of Lazarus. Why do we want to go and do the things that we were once rescued from when those things nearly destroyed our lives? That's the picture that Paul is painting. Now, one more thing to complete this thought before we move to verse 13. Just as being circumcised physically hurts. Again, if you're an adult male, ooh. But so too does being circumcised of the heart by Jesus hurt. Because we have to put away things that we like to do. Your flesh is still craving all the things that you used to do, whether it's the, the drinking or the drugs or the anger, the unforgiveness, the sexual immorality. Your flesh still wants to do all those things. And it hurts to cut those things away. Sometimes we have to cut away people from our lives. Old friends, family members, old habits or routines. And often it's painful. But, but he's been my friend forever. But, but if your friend is dragging you away from the Lord, but, but it's my family, you know, family comes first. When Jesus storms your heart, he comes first. He always comes first. And we have to remember that. And yes, sometimes there's pain. Jesus said, I've come to divide families. Now, that wasn't his desire, but, but that was the reality. And I think most of us in this room, especially if our commitment to the Lord is, is, is complete, I think we've lost friends. We've lost family members. You're not as fun as you used to be in their eyes. Well, that's exactly what's natural for the man or the woman of God. That's the payoff. We walk with Jesus. He comes first. And we give the people that we used to hang with an opportunity to see the power of God demonstrated through your life. Why should we trust him? Verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. Now I can tell you, I'm going to be giving my testimony two weeks from Sunday. I can tell you that I was a dead man walking around. Now I didn't think I was dead. I could talk, I could do things, but I was a dead man walking around. There was nothing but emptiness in my heart. There was always this cry, this, God, there's got to be more out there. And you know, even when you're not saved, you, you call out to God. I was dead. There was no life. There was no hope. There was no joy. Not only was I miserable, but I was doing the best I could to make everybody around me miserable. And God simply said, I choose you. I love you. If I would have said, well, why? Because? 
That's what your children say to you when you ask them why they did something. Well, because. God's only reason was that he loved me. There's nothing that we can add to that. There's nothing that we have to do. We were dead, walking around, and God made you alive. When there was no hope in your life, when it was dark, Wednesday night's Bible study and almost pretty heavy Bible study. Talked about darkness, and in one place it says pitch dark. That was what my life was like. And that's when Jesus came rushing into the, my heart and changed everything with that circumcision of the heart that only he could provide. He loved you. He hated watching you walk around dead. And so he called you by name. And one of the things that breaks my heart, perhaps more than almost anything else I deal with, I hate seeing Christians whose hearts get hard. Sometimes it's just for a little while. Other times it's forever. The same Christian that was once filled with joy, the Christian that was just in awe of the fact that God would use him or use her to do anything at all. Things didn't have to be going well because, well, Jesus was there and they were so grateful. And to watch those people as their hearts harden, as they stop being in awe of the goodness of God and what he's done in their lives. They slowly drift away and they start down the path of sin. And you can look at them and you can see that things aren't right. Sin has a look. We all know that look. It's just painful. How you doing? Doing great, never better. And you, you know better. It's not true. And it breaks my heart when I see that. You know, one of the things that's, for me personally, such a joy is watching so many of you, you, you remain just as excited as you were when you first realized exactly what God has done for you. See the people serving at Malta Medical, the people serving here at the academy. And they're just as excited today as they were when they first started. That's the way it's always supposed to be. With Jesus, we should never get cold or lukewarm. Why? Because when you were dead, he made you alive. And it says he forgave us all our sins. Now, my sin tally was pretty impressive. I'm sure the same thing is true for some of you. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, in the Roman world, when people were crucified, on the cross, they nailed the charges against them. The king of the Jews. That was the charge against Jesus. They nailed it to the cross, so when people came into Rome, the deterrent factor would be extreme. They would see these bodies wasting away on the cross. They'd see the charges, and they'd know, don't mess with Rome or don't mess with Texas. Same kind of idea. The charges against me, the charges against you, Jesus took those charges away. You know, it's easy for us to forget the statement that he forgave us of all of our sins. Now, this is one of the most practical things I'm going to say to you tonight. Stop doing guilt over your sins. Stop doing guilt. Repent if you're convicted. And then get right with God and walk with him. Don't keep beating yourself up for the things that you've already done, the sins that have already been confessed, and we know they're paid for. He forgave us of all of our sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins. What that means is that when we're born again, we are truly secure in Christ. God's not a human like we are. He's not keeping a record of wrongs. I love that in 1 Corinthians 13... 
It says love keeps no record of wrongs. If God kept the record of my wrongs, I'd never feel peaceful. I'd never feel safe. I'd never feel secure in Christ. But there's no record of wrongs. And one of the things that really inhibits so many of our walk with the Lord is that we keep a record of our own wrongs. We figure like, well, well, I blew it. God's disappointed or God's angry. He's not. He died for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Think about what that means. If you're here tonight and your past is so horrible that it hurts to talk about, if you murdered someone, if you're drunk, drug addict, if you're angry, if you're holding on to unforgiveness, those sins have been completely wiped out. I've had people tell me, well, I don't feel forgiven. That's one of the most arrogant things any of us can ever say. If you don't feel forgiven, it's because the devil is lying to you, or it's because you simply haven't invested enough time in your Bible to believe what it says. One of the biggest struggles I had in my early walk with the Lord is all of the guilt and condemnation that I was constantly experiencing. I know now it was spiritual attack, but I had done so many horrible things. There was so much shame and embarrassment attached to my sin that I could never get over it. I would ask God to forgive me for the same sins over and over and over and over again. One day while I was just reading through Romans chapter 3, the 24th verse, a verse I'd read many, many times already, but it was a verse where God really met me. We have been justified freely. He stopped me right there. When did that happen? Well, I knew enough to say, well, Lord, it happened at the cross. When did that happen? Well, that was 2,000 years ago. And he asked me the question, well, why don't you believe me? Why are you still letting these sins cause you all this grief? I believe it's sort of like Christian and Pilgrim's Progress. The burden of sin kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and once it fell off, he was absolutely free. I think tonight God wants some of you to be set free. Doesn't matter what you did in your past. I had a question on the radio show, I think it was today. Uh, um, somebody said, I've fallen in love with a girl. I'm, we're, we're, I'm a recent convert. I've fallen in love with a girl, and, and uh, she got saved, and she wanted to, to share her past with me, and he said, i got to admit, it's pretty shocking. What should I do, he said. And I said, you should open your arms and say, welcome to Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. He wants you tonight to believe that about you. He forgave us all of our sins. Not some of them. He forgave the sins that you feel guilty about. He forgave the sins that you're being drawn back into. He forgave sins you haven't even committed yet. The result should be unfettered joy and thanksgiving and gratitude. And we hear this all the time. It's easy to forget the wonder of this statement. He forgave us all of our sins. Now that he canceled the written code is especially meaningful. If there were no law, there would be no sin. But the reality is there's always been a law. We still have Christians sort of frustrated because the Ten Commandments. We don't follow the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm glad we don't have to follow the Ten Commandments. Because when we did, as, a, as humans, we couldn't. And those commandments busted us. 
the law kept saying, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. It pointed us out as sinners. We were busted before we even got a chance to try to defend ourselves. The written code pointed out our guilt. Well, the written code was nailed to the cross. We did lose sound. Lost our Oh, here we go. The written code. You see, we still should keep the Ten Commandments. Well, but, but you see, it's not a got to, it's a get to. And I really want that to hit home in your heart. Because of what he's done for us, that list that opposed you is dead. It was like a very powerful prosecuting attorney pointing a finger at you and declaring before the whole world, this is who you are. This is how guilty you are. And just when the case was ready to go to the jury, Jesus walks in, he takes the list, and he nails it to the cross. And you're free. And you're clean. I can almost hear the Lord look at me and say, Ron, where are your accusers now? And like the woman caught in the act of adultery in the Gospel of John, I could say, I don't know. Neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. I can't begin to tell you how significant this statement is. Though we were all busted by the law that opposed us, an old blood-stained cross redeemed us. It's about as basic as Christianity gets. You are now set free and are alive in Christ. Let's settle this issue once and for all. If you're here and you're still dabbling in sin, it's one thing to say, well, I'm really struggling with it. We'll stop struggling when the victory's already been purchased. Get so close to Jesus that sin disgusts you. We have got to to understand how utterly sinful we are. We put sin in different categories. Well, this is really, really bad. I don't do that like some people. And this just isn't, it's not that bad a sin. And after all, you know, it's what I like to do. We really need to learn to hate our sin. We're guilty. Then we're set free. Why run back? to the sin which almost destroyed us. Victory can be ours. That's what verse 15 is, and we'll close. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, we've talked about this in our Old Testament Bible studies. We've had uh, kings would go out and have a victory, and then they would bring their captives back in sort of a public parade. They put fish hooks in their lips and just drag them along sometimes for hundreds of miles. Well, that's what's happened to your sin and mine. The next time that you think, I can't deal with my sin, I can't, it's just too strong for me. Remember, Jesus has made a public spectacle of your sin. You know, when Jesus died, the devil thought he won a great victory. The demonic world rejoiced because at least for a moment they thought Mission was accomplished. Imagine what it was like in the demonic world when news spread that the tomb was empty. What? How can that be? We won. You know, in the book of Revelation, I love, this sounds terrible, I, I love the fact that Moses and Elijah, when they finally die, at the three and a half year part of the Great Tribulation, and, and that th God allows the people to kill them. Their bodies are desecrated for three days, dragged through the streets in the Middle Eastern country, and especially for Jews. That's the, the worst indignity of all. And after desecrating their bodies, after the whole world is partying, the troublemakers are gone, the troublemakers are gone, all of a sudden the breath of life comes back in them. And Elijah and Moses rise up and ascend to the heavens. 
before their very eyes. One minute a party, the next minute, uh oh. Well, that's what I want the devil to say about your life and mine. Uh oh. I had them at one time and now I've lost them. I went after them, I did everything that I could. But he who is in them is greater than I am, the devil would say. We can make a public spectacle of our sin. Jesus disarmed the devil. The devil can't harm the child of God. He can huff and puff and threaten to blow our houses down. And it's scary sometimes. But listen to this verse I'm going to close with tonight. And in the middle of your battle against sin and temptation, the battle of your flesh versus your spirit, remember this. It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. And tonight, God wants you to believe that. Victory over sin has already been accomplished. All God wants in that victory parade is an accomplice. That's you, a partner in the battle against sin. So when you leave tonight, no more guilt, no more condemnation, no more living a defeated life. You have to choose those things. Jesus' choice is victory. Can I have the pastor's wife or the pastor's new wives from the pastor's class up here in front? Father, as we close tonight, I pray, Lord, that this is a message of freedom for some of us tonight.